So my talk is going to be somewhat different from all other talks that you've seen. So in my talk, uh, you see the overview of thing. You see a bunch of technical terms that I'm not sure that you know. But just in case you don't know any technical terms, raise your hand. And I'll, I'll try to explain what it means. Okay. In my talk, there's going to be no, almost no technical detail. It's more like a survey talk. Oh. So this talk is the way you want to enjoy with, with, with an amazing set of people over the year. So it's not just my, not just my efforts. A lot of people going into this. Um, and some of the people in the audience as well. So I talk about planar graph and beyond. Right? So what it means to me, you know, planar graph is, is, is this sort of little graph on the, on the leftmost here, which is a graph that you can draw on the plane without S crossing. So I hope that many people see or know the planar graph. Okay, so the middle is a graph embedded on the surfaces, like these uh, here genus one graph, which is a, a more a generalization of planar graph. And then there's gonna be more general class of graphs, which is minor free, the structure is a little bit more complicated, well, a lot more complicated to describe that I don't try to describe here, but you can see the planar graph on the left is sort of something even simple and, and um, that's going to be the main topic of the talk. And sometimes I do mention the result for the graph in the middle and the graph on the right. But most of the time, I, I talk about planar graph. So the beyond means graph on the right most part. Okay. So we call these thing topological graph because it's have nine topology for that reason. All right. So you know, planar graphs is the study of, of, of designing algorithm for planar graphs starting from the work of Lipton and Tarjan from from 79, which is a very long time ago. And over the last couple of decades, a lot of algorithmic tools that, that people developed stemming from the nine topological planar graph. So I, I, I throw out a bunch of these tools here. If many of these tools doesn't make sense to you, which is fine, OK? The main point that I'm trying to say is there's a lot of tools. Okay? It solves a lot of problems. So any problem you can think of, we do have really good algorithm in planar graph, okay? Because these things are directly coming from the structure, the nine topological structure of planar graph. I, I wouldn't talk about any of these things here in detail, okay? Um, but, you know, this is also the question that I asked myself a couple of years ago. What else can be done? Because people did a lot. So we came up with amazing set of algorithmic tools. So what else can be done here? <coughs> And it turns out there's, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't know about geometry of planar graph. By geometry, what I mean is that you take a planar graph, maybe it's this K4 on the left, you have some edge weighted, okay, and look at the shortest side matrix, meaning that the pairwise distances between all pair vertices, you put it into, uh, in, into a matrix form, is we get something that we call a discrete matrix space. And we, we want to, you know, the same, the same graph, if you put different weight on the edges, you get different uh, matrix spaces out of the same graph. So even the same graph with the same structure is a put different weight, you get different matrix. So understanding this is, is somewhat more difficult. Okay? Just because there's a lot of different geometry you can get from the same single graph just by playing with the weight. And, and the question is, do planar matrix, what I mean is it's like the matrix space of the shortest path, so it have special structure, right? Do we have this, anything special about that? Because you can see that you can, you can play with the weight and came up with a lot of different uh, discrete matrix spaces. And how does it help in algorithm design? So I'll try to give you a taste of these things, not very much in the, not in the technical detail. So that is kind of, these uh, main team of the talk. So we're trying to understand the matrix spaces uh, by uh, coming from planar graph. Okay. <clears throat> and, and this question is not uh, something new. People study in the 90s. The famous result is Klein, Plotkin, and Rao, which is saying, well, if you are given any parameter delta, you can construct a random partition. Uh, you construct a random partition of planar matrix so that you know, all these clusters coming from the random partition, here you can think of this is one of these random partition, and this is the second one. The third one, you can just, 
you know, it's a run, this is random partition, so if you sample the partition, maybe you get something <coughs> on the left. You sample again, maybe something you get in, something you get in the middle. So all the clusters have diameter bounded by delta, and the probabilities of, an, uh, of, an, of two vertices U and V being put to different set, different cluster, proportional to the length of UV. Okay, so for example, if we take the first random partition, U and V are plate in the same cluster, which is a blue thing here, but if you try again, second time, maybe they are put into a different cluster, because these, these things are random. And, uh, and this is say something about, say something about geometry of planar graph, like, you know, they do random partitions, is the probability of being cut is, is, uh, is proportional to the length. And if, if you, and for general matrix, you don't get um, order one time DGUV, for general matrix, you pay a log n factor. So something about planar matrix is special. And these have a lot of location in community flows, but it's got then it's me, uh, linear, minimum linear arrangement problems. So all these very interesting problems can be solved using this sort of random partition. So it says something about geometry of planar graph. Second classical result is by Rao. We're saying for well, planar matrix, you can embed into uh, L1. Actually, you can embed into L2 with, with distortion square root log n, which we cannot do for general metric. So something special about planar matrix. Uh, and that gives you, by embedding, I mean like you, you, you map a vertex to, uh, uh, to you know, a bunch of coordinates and then you can call it out, uh, one distance after the map, which is uh, F here. And then by distortion square root n, I mean like the distortion between uh, the, of the point that you map the, the vertices uh, is at least the distance in the, di in, in the uh, input graph and at most square root n log n the distance in, of the input graph. So, so this also says something special about, about, about planar matrix. This resolves, uh, you know, in the early 2000s. And, and this result in, imply, for example, square root log n approximation for what is cut in planar graph. Now it is subsumed by another result uh, for general graph, but it was uh, novel back then. And it's, it's also related to some uh, famous conjecture on planar graph is that you can embed into L1 with constant distortion. We have no idea how to do this now. Even we don't know how to be square root log n of brow. People try, but still we don't have answer. So, you know, it, uh, you, can, you can say something, but it's difficult. And if you can get, you know, a log, uh, uh, constant distortion, you get constant approximation for sparsely cut. It's considered, you know, very well studied and famous problem. So my research is, is somewhat different. My research isn't about just say, hey, does it have something special? Because ultimately, planar graph is graph embedded on the Euclidean plane. So that's the definition. And I want to say, well, whether the Euclidean metric, which is two-dimensional Euclidean plane, does it have something to do with the metric of planar graph? Right? The metric of planar graph, you have these power to set the weight, the distance, Euclidean plane. If you have a bunch of points on the Euclidean plane, the metric is fixed. Right? So, but I still want to say, I want to study the analogy. So in one sense, planar graph had nothing to do with Euclidean plane. Okay? In one sense, in the sense of embedding, when we're going to say even a very stupid graph, which is a star graph with one center and everything in the leaf, if we want to embed into, say, the Euclidean plane, the distortion you're going to get is going to be square root n. Okay? If you want to embed in Euclidean plane because of something that we call the packing bow, because if it look like, because distance between every star leap, probably two, and if you pack them into a unit disk, the only way you can do probably with the planar grid here in the minimum, so the distance gonna be contracted by one over square root n. So, you know, embedding is very bad. That means, in one sense, it say that you know, planar graph had nothing to do with Euclidean plane metric, because they don't embed well. But not really, it's not the only way we can say that whether they are similar. Okay. Embedding, if, it, if it's the, the distortion is small, then it's great. We had a good embedding, but, but we don't. Um, I should say square root n here. So this, this, this typo. So what, what, what I've been trying to do was develop different techniques to bring different tools. So we're trying to look at tool from, from Euclidean space and then still trying to bring it to the realm planar metric. So this is what I mean by the analogy. Um, <coughs> I'll give you a couple of examples okay, of these things to be more concrete, but that's the general idea. So I'll give you four examples. I'm not sure I have time to go through all four, but we'll try to do it anyway. 
So the first thing is I'm adding into a small trig width. So let's say that I give you a set of points in the Euclidean plane. So these are points in Euclidean plane. And you want to uh, embed into graph with small tree width, something like you know, constant. Think about epsilon is constant, and the distortion you want is one plus epsilon. Anybody know uh, tree width? So I saw some hand, hand raises, is good. Um, but if you don't know what it is, tree width basically is about a tree width is something like you start with a tree, and then you start adding a couple of vertices here, maybe the tree that look like this. And uh, you add vertices along each of these template tree here. Allow, you are allowed to add edges between everything in, these, uh, in the sub, uh, sub set of vertices as a template. And then you are allowed to add edges between them. So by the tree with graph is something similar to tree, but a little bit bigger in the sense that it not now is not a single vertex. It could be a, a couple more, like a constant number of these vertices. So the number of vertices you see in this node here that we call the tree width. Okay? And, and we want something like tree with gravity. And for Euclidean point set, you can do it quite uh, not, so, uh, 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 not so difficult. So first, suppose that the diameter, so let's say the diameter of the point set is delta. Okay, so this is, and I want in a, a distortion with, uh, with plus epsilon delta. So something that is, depends on the parameter epsilon I'm given, but it could be, uh, but it's comparable to the diameter, okay? What you can do is just, hey, let's first take an uh, epsilon delta net, and by the packing bow, we don't have so many points that are distant epsilon delta from each other. You know, look at the disk of, of, of diameter delta, if you look at points that are epsilon delta from each other, you only have a constant number of points. That's it. And that we call the net points, which is the red point here, and then we create a Every other point is going to be close to one of these, uh, uh, one of these red points that I, that I select here. And then you create a click between these red points because the only constant number of these things. So make a click out of that. And then we attack every other point to the closest red point. And that we call an embedding. Why is this is small tree width? Well, we can think of like the, 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 the big click going to be one in a single back, in a single back in the, in the template. And that preserves distance between these red points exactly. And then for the other distance between other points from y, h to y here, you can so go to the nearest red point, go directly to the other red point, and go back to y. Okay, it's not trivial, but, uh, but it's not so difficult. You can get tree with something 1 over epsilon square. This is tree width. If you work hard enough, you can reduce the tree width to, uh, to 1 over epsilon. It's not easy, but, but you can do that. Can we do the same for planar metric? So that's the first question. And we try to find analogy between the two things. Right? And, and in planar metric, you don't have a packing bow. So this construction is going to be completely broke out because in planar metric, the number of red points is not going to be a constant. All right. Yes, but it's difficult. But we, technically, you still can do it. It's still open problem. Okay? So for example, in planar metric, like suppose that you had a planar graph of diameter delta, you want to map into a smaller tree width graph so that the distortion is at most epsilon times delta, where epsilon is a parameter that is given. You can do it, and the tree width of the first paper in 19 was like 1 over epsilon to the 60. You know, it's a very complicated algorithm, and these bowers is very, very big. And, uh, last year, we gave us sort of much simpler algorithm, but we have t with log log n square over epsilon. And the log log n square is somewhat strange, but it depends on the number of vertices of the input graph. So, you know, it's undesirable in the sense that it depends on how many points that you have in the input graph. So that's, it's, uh, it's non-trivial, but it's uh, not really um, desirable. And recently, we get now the t with 1 over epsilon to the power of 4. Uh, with our work with a, with a lot of people, you probably would hear, would hear about this uh, in more detail in, in the next talk by Shinti. I won't talk about the detail here, but you can see why, what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that we're trying to match what we know for Euclidean space. And there's still an open problem whether you can really match this, which is a tree with 1 over epsilon. We still don't know. We have the lower bound of omega 1 over epsilon. So 1 over epsilon is the best we can do, but we don't know how to match this. We can see. So that's the first analogy that I'm talking about. 
Okay. Now the second analogy is somewhat. Uh, um, it's, it, okay, so, so let's say, so you, you now you have also points at the nuclear plane. You will see example again and again. We start with points at the nuclear plane and we try to say something about it. If you want a randomized embedding with expected one plus epsilon multiplicative distortion, okay? Now it's not, now the distortion doesn't depend on the diameter of the point set anymore. It has to be multiplicative with respect to every pair point. Okay, so that means like you really want to preserve distances almost exactly. Okay, it's a, it's a little bit of slack. And you want the trig width to be log n over epsilon. Log n over epsilon is the best. You can do for Poisson and Euclidean plane. And this is a classical resolve by Aurora in 97 for his P dash for TSPs and, and the subsequent work by Tawa. Really, they, what they are showing is that for points at the Euclidean plane, you can embed into graph with tree with log n over epsilon with really good expected distribution one plus epsilon. That is something you can do for Euclidean plane. This, uh, I, I wouldn't talk about the detail of this, but it's not so difficult. Okay. Now the same question is: Can we do the same for planar metric? Okay. And this turned out to be a very difficult question. Or I don't know whether it's difficult, but. Uh, but a lot of negative result before we, we work on these problems. A lot of negative saying, you know, probably log n over c is low enough for any distortion c that you like. You know. And also, if you look at deterministic embedding, you, you can't do anything interesting. The trick with log n, a trick with square root n. So it's not clear how even you get something better than order square root n for any constant expected distortion. This is what. Um, so the question is there, the question is there, like can we embed with tree with log n over epsilon? The question is there, but we just don't know how to do it. Until recently, we are able to say the tree with log n over epsilon is about 30. It's a very weird number. Uh, more, it's, it's, well, the, the number is big, sure, but, uh, but it says that we, we can do something. We can do something very close to, to what we can do for Euclidean plane. So that is the main matches. And you know, it's have a lot of applications. Uh, you know, once you, in the past, I probably forget about application. Maybe I, I forget about application to say about this thing. I should talk about application to motivate all of these things, <laughs> but I keep forgetting. <laughs> so you, know, you get uh, a, a um, polynomial term approximation scheme for many problems, vehicle routing and case centers and, and, and all that in, in planar graph. And, and for this uh, embedding, we get something like a first Q-beta for vehicle routing with bounded cap unbounded capacity or the, the, the capacitated clustering problem. Now we, uh, it's interesting, now we lost the signal. Oh, all right, okay, it's suddenly good. All right, good. So, so the open problem, like can we get the matching the result for Euclidean plate? We uh, recently, we made significant progress with this problem. So, um, as of now, still open, but, uh, but you know, you can see the, the, the kind of mindset, like we're trying to match what we know for Euclidean plane. So, different from the first one you told, which was easier, that's an additive distortion? Yeah. And this is like multiplicative distortion? Just multiplicative distortion. So the additive distortion, you have the very big slack. You can think of additive distortion is like, you know, I, because of the delta is diameter, so I only care about preserving distances between points that are very far away, like almost the diameter. Points that are very close to each other, I just don't care. Right. So this is additive distortion is saying, well, I only care about points that are very far from each other. Even though, you know, it sounds like, um, very re relaxed, but, but still have a lot of allocation follow from that. <laughs> and for multiplicative distortion, what we're trying to say is you know, every pair, regardless of how close and far, they have to have distance preserve. So that makes the pro problem much more difficult. And, and this actually is the idea to get these things to give the first PTAS for TSP in Euclidean plane, which is a very big result in the 90, early 2000. So preserving distance is really, really difficult if you want to 
to preserve um, pairwise distances. So this is, you know, embedding. So, you know, planar metric has nothing to do with Euclidean metric, but somehow they are very similar in some sense. If you look at a, into a right problem, into right angle, you can see a lot of similarity. So that problem is kind of weird, but uh, we call it tree cover. Okay, so basically, we start with a point set in Euclidean plane. So that's a template for every problem. We start with point set in Euclidean plane. We study what, it, what we know about it, and then we ask the same question for planar graph. So that's a template. And the tree cover is a, the tree cover is a collection of different trees. I, the collection of constant number of trees. Okay, think about epsilon and constant. We only have constant number of trees. And for every point, I said Y, you pick any point, I said Y, there would be some tree in the collection. So I denote T, H, Y here. Where the distance between X and Y in the tree, the distance here is about one plus epsilon approximation of the original distance. Okay, there's something in the tree. There's some tree in the collection that preserves distances up to one plus epsilon. Okay, so that's the definition of tree cover. Does this make sense? And I only have a constant. Uh, in Euclidean uh, plane, the very classical result in 95 saying that you can construct a constant number of trees. So it's a very beautiful result. And the same question, can we do the same for planar graph? You, know, you see this question again and again. Right? Can you do this for planar metric with uh, one of them? Uh, surprisingly, we, we, uh, we made some headway, some progress toward, but the first result is by Bata and Fandina and Nyman. You get uh, the number of trees going to be log n over epsilon square, so something that depends on log n. Yeah, it's non contraction property. I forget about that. We should say, like, this one is, um, uh, well, this should be saying the, uh, this is, yes, I uh, wrote in wrong, uh, wrong here. Thank you for correcting me. For graphs related to the subtrees, uh, subgraphs. Well, it doesn't have to be subtree for graph. It doesn't have to be subtree. Okay, you can use points that are completely out of nowhere. This is a good question, great question. So it doesn't have to be a subgraph. Okay. So you can do this for planar graph with log n over epsilon square. So it's something depends on the number of, of, of vertices, which is undesirable, because we want something that doesn't depend, because the, the, the result for, uh, for Euclidean plane saying that, oh, you know, there's no dependency on the number of points in the input. And so we tried very hard, and recently we get something, the number of trees, like 1 over epsilon to the power of 4. Okay, we're getting there, but not quite much. Yeah. So there, and there's a lot of application for this object. So once you get this object, you get good approximate distant oracle. Basically, uh, a distant oracle is a bundle of trees, and whenever you query the distance between two points, it goes through a tree and query the distance. Right? And one of the minimum distance returned by one of the trees is going to be a good approximation. Or, you know, is there some other problem in routing and the technique developed, so other problem, probably Shinji would talk more about it. My talk wouldn't be technical detail, but still open problem in where, where, whether we can really match what we know for Euclidean plane. So every problem that I talk here, the only way accompanying, uh, accompanying the open problem, we don't know. Uh, but we, we try to sort of match them together. So this is the third result, the third sort of analogy. I agree with the fourth, depending on how much time do I have. But we'll see about that. The fourth. Um, so for all these problems, has the stainer version been studied? Like, you only care about preserving the uh, distances between points that you give as input. Right. Uh, has something like that been studied? So the tree cover, I mean, study for general graph. You know, people study these things. No, I was asking, like, uh, you have these embeddings, right, like in right. R2, uh, R2, so what I'm asking is, instead of preserving distance for all points, right. if I tell you these are the pairs of points, I'm actually ah, passing. Ah, so it's sort of like a uh, pair-wide version. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. I actually don't know. I'm not aware of the work, but, you know, there are a lot of work like that in pair-wide spanners and pair-wide preservers and all that, but it's not really embedding. Uh, embedding, I'm not sure that this... Um, you know, um, only preserving some pair give you something. So I'm not sure, but, but yeah, the answer would be, I don't know. <laughs> Just a shortest answer. 
You had questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I guess these tree covers aren't like strictly speaking sufficient, but like, is there anything known if I want like, a Ramsey type of bedding? Ramsey type of bedding you have low about. So you have to have, for so example, distortion alpha, you need to spend n to the one of alpha tree. Even for a planar graph. Even for planar graph. Okay. Or even for a series parallel graph. Okay. Like, even very, very small. So Ramsey, C, Ramsey tree would, would, would cut it. The third thing, uh, the fourth thing that I'm talking about, probably very briefly, was VC dimension. Now, I find definition of VC dimension very weird. Okay, I, I, it took me a long time to understand what I'm writing here. Uh, if you've seen it before, it's great. If you haven't seen it before, found it difficult to understand. Yes, it's difficult to understand. I'm not trying to explain it. Okay, uh, it also took me a very long time to understand. All right, so but this is okay. This is okay. So. Here is a very classical result. Like if you take a bunch of ball on Euclidean plane, just look at all the collection of balls, maybe infinite number, number of them, because you have infinite number of points, you have infinite number of, of, of radius. So let's look at all these things. The VC dimension is three, okay? Very classical result in, in, in Euclidean geometry. So if you don't know what it is, uh, I'm not sure that's what I wrote makes sense in the definition, but uh, okay, let's, let's accept it. Um, how about planar graph? You know, the same questions again. You see the same question again and again. Surprisingly, in, in, plane, minor, uh, in planar and minor free graph, you can also define ball in this way. So ball is going to be the set of vertices that are within distance R from the center. You know, like these are discrete balls. They are not continuous ball. And then you take all the ball, center and all the vertices. You take all the radius that you could think of. Actually, Z is set of finite. So it's not infinite, but it's finite. But it could be very big. And if we look at these metric balls, have very small VC dimension. Like 4 for planar graph and K is minus 1 for minor freeze. It's a very, very strange result. But you point an Estalon, vexes. And you can use these things to compute diameter in subquadratic time, in truly subquadratic time. That's in mind blowing. Like how people use these things to, to compute diameter. <coughs> So what we recently do is we relax that even if we relax the ball to directed version, which is, you know, now the ball here now had direction. So that means that the, the, uh, the set of vertices where the directed distance from the center to the vertex is mod R. If we define the ball, we still have a small VC dimension, even if we talk about directed graph. And then we get the first exact distance neural core with truly subquadratic space and low, and low running time which is not possible in, in general graph, just purely beyond these VC dimension result. So it's something very strange. Uh, I guess I don't have time now. I, you know, I wish I had time to talk more about the result by Lee and Potter, which is amazing sort of VC dimension, but because I don't have time, so let me skip it. Mm. So, you know, to conclude my talk, so, you know, with, with Einstein, the analogy between Euclidean plane and, and plane and matrix has been very productive. And, I, you know, maybe if you want to work on planar graph, probably this is one of the directions that you can think that you could, uh, you could come and contribute. Because as far as I know, it's still pretty much open. Like, you know, maybe there's some other object that you can that you do in, plane, uh, in Euclidean plane that you can bring to to the realm of planar metric. But I'll stop here. Right, any questions? Embedding, so the one is it's not so the, the the low bound that I'm talking about mentioned in the past will, it isn't about running time uh, on running time because you know proving low bound running time very difficult, and, um, but it is um, these things that I'm very uh, intrigued with. So the technique is kind of uh, um, how can I say it in a couple of sentences so that it it makes some sense. So. Basically, what they're trying to do is that, hey, you, you know, you came up with, with the graph so that you know that for any deterministic algorithm, there are going to be some pair that, that you have to map it very far away. You can't feasible because, you know, planar, think about planar grid. 
it have a big tree width, and you want to map into a small tree width graph, you have to distort some pairs that are very far away. So this is the idea of the, the deterministic lower bound. For randomized lower bound, all you have to do is bootstrapping, and because you know, for determining, you, you can think of randomized embedding as a convex combination of deterministic embedding. Okay, so once you prove strong result for deterministic embedding, you can bootstrap it to, to randomize by, by Yao minimax, things like that. Yeah, and one more question. Uh, so you talk about uh, using planar graphs, planar magic diagrams. I just wonder how much planar magic has been designed that it's around. So, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of applications along the way, right? So, um, most of the time, you know, most of the time, I, for me, specifically, I care a lot about um, solving optimization problem. Like, for example, can you show a classical example is TS TSP. Can you solve TSP in planar graph within uh, one plus epsilon approximation, where the running time could be depend on epsilon? So this is a very classical result. These are known and this will solve. Uh, but you can imagine a lot more different, more complicated uh, combinatorial optimization problem. And this kind of embedding is, is sort of uh, the gateway towards to, to get these sort of approximation algorithm. Because basically, what we're saying is that for very complicated planar metric, you can embed into a very simple metric, which is small tree width, and why you preserve almost distances between all pair. And so basically, through the embedding, the solution of the optimization problem is also preserved. And then now you just solve the problem on this graph of small tree width. There is a, a lot of techniques to help you solve this problem on small tree width. Basically, it looks like trees, and you can, you can solve it very quick. So, so. So, um, did the results for planar graph extend to uh, bounded graph with bounded genus? All of the results here, except for uh, tree covers, uh, uh, some of them are standard, like the, the, the last VC dimensional results that I told you, it's straightly. Some of the other results depend. For example, tree cover, we don't know how to do it for bounded, tree, uh, for, you know, bounded genus. Well, biology in a graph, you can do it. I think you can do it with the sort of um, topological surgery, right? But beyond that, it's more difficult, minor free. So a lot of the results I'm talking here, you can extend it to about a genus graph by, you know, doing surgeries. You cut the graph into a planar graph, and then you, you can still do it. Okay,